When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what, what a glory sheds away. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not the cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign or a tear can abide what we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he does richly repay not a grief or a loss not a frown or a cross but it's blessed if we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all of the altar we lay. For the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fare only trust and obey. Trust and obey.
somebody praise the Lord God is worthy to be praised what do you say it is my privilege again to welcome each and every one of us to this house of worship welcome one and all are we feeling good in the Lord are we feeling nice in Jesus come on now Amen. give God a praise then now praise the Lord Amen. good to see you my sister right and next to my sister right you know everything is all right <laughs> good to see you my brother we I'm uh, happy to see the bridging, and we give God praise for his grace and his mercy to our brothers and sisters online. We are saying welcome. Welcome, my dear sister. Um, what's your name, sis? Sister McCoy. Sister McCoy, we are so happy to have you Amen. worshiping with us today. What the church say? Amen. We give God the praise that is due to his name. You know, every single day I'm looking forward for the word. What do you say? Every single day, and when we, when we don't come on, on Mondays and Thursdays, I feel like something is missing in the day. <laughs> you know, the word of God is sweet. And you know, the enemy is fighting, he's fighting, he's fighting. I tell you, today I was pressing my, my, my shirt, trying to say, you know what, I'm going to get like a row of shirts together, you know? And my iron just goes on me. I said, what is this? Get behind this, Satan. I went for the other iron, and they're not working either. The two of them, I had to trash them. I said, you know... I'm coming to the house of God in Jesus' name. You know, other brothers are is having issues. Members should be here today, and they're having car issues. And, you know, but guess what? This is a good sign. What do you say? It's a good sign. It tells us that 
The Lord is about to deliver. What do you say? And he wants to bless us indeed. And so we are just going to greet each other in Jesus' name. We're going to move speedily tonight. As we see, the time is swiftly passing by. We're going to have a special prayer in a little while. Our emphasis is going to be on repentance. What did I say? Repentance. The Lord says that if we repent, then he will hear our cry. What do you say? And so at this time, we're going to stand. We're going to greet each other. And our, our, also our, our, our fellowship song again. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Are you happy you're part of the family of God? Stand and greet somebody as we sing this wonderful one now. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Come on. I've been washed in this fountain. Cleansed by his blood, oh, 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 oh. joined him with Jesus, Jesus as we travel along. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. So reach out and touch, oh yes, touch somebody. Yes, we can. can reach out and touch somebody's hand. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this church a better place. And make this church a better place. Yes, we can. I'm so glad oh, 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 I'm a part oh, 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 of the family of God. I've been washed in this fountain. Cleansed by His blood, join tears with Jesus as we travel along. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome to our brothers and sisters online. And we are all a part of the family the family of God. You know, there's a cliche that says the family that prays together, the what? Stays together. And so we are going to practice that cliche tonight because we believe that it's not just a cliche. It is a divine gift from God. What do you say? And when we pray together, friends, we are pulled closer to Jesus. And in being pulling closer to Jesus, we are pulled closer to each other. What do you say? And so we know that days are filled with sorrow and tears. But we know that burdens are lifted where? At Calvary. And Jesus is where? Very, very near. Days are filled. Our sister Henry come to pray for us tonight. Tonight our special emphasis is going to be on repentance. Jesus says, if my people who are is called by my name shall humble themselves and turn. The promise is that he will hear our cry and it will heal our land. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and lonely and dear. But burdens are lifted up. As we pray, let us kneel Jesus as we pray. Is very near. Let us kneel for prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry. 
everything to God in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, once more, we, your children, we come in your presence this evening. Father, we seek your forgiveness. We pray for cleansing. We pray, dear Lord, that you will fill us with your sweet Holy Spirit. Baptize us anew, Lord, with power from on high. Lord, we are so grateful to be here one more time in your courts, dear Heavenly Father. Because in your presence, Lord, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, Heavenly Father, there are pleasures forevermore. We pray, dear God, that you will surround us, your people. We pray, dear Lord, that you will be with those who are online. Bless them, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, be with those who are on their way. We are asking you to grant them journey in mercies. And Lord, this evening, we're asking you to revive us. We're asking you to cleanse us. We're asking you to wash us, dear Heavenly Father. Father, we seek your forgiveness. And we're asking you, Lord, to have mercy upon each and every one of us. Lord, we just want to put your man's servant into your hands. Father, we pray that you will bless him. We pray that you will put words in his mouth. We pray, dear Lord, that you will surround him. Let not him be seen this evening, but your name will be high and lifted up. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will cramp and paralyze every plan of that whole serpent. We pray, dear Lord, that this evening your name will be lifted up and someone will come to know you who is life eternal. So, Lord, we leave the service into your hands and into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And the lifted at Calvary, Calvary, church family. Good evening, good evening, good evening. How is everybody doing? Amen. Now, I just have a very small request. Um, I know that it's not uh, very uh, many of us, so uh, I have a request that we actually come closer to the front. Come closer to the front. It does many things. Um, it, uh, it permits us to be more attentive and it also uh, looks better on camera uh, because especially, you know, many times when you do the playback and there's not very many persons in the front, it gives this illusion as if uh, the word of God is being communicated to the benches or the chairs. <clears throat> amen, amen and amen. Now, before we begin, I'm just going to have a word of prayer, and we will have our quiz. We'll have our quiz. Uh, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us out here this evening. I just pray, dear Father, that you would please be with us even in this quiz as we seek to retain these vital truths that are so necessary for our salvation. And we just pray that you would keep us to this end in Jesus' name. Amen. I also just want to make a uh, quick advertisement, uh, as it were, of sorts. Now, has everybody gotten a rat card? Has anybody, has everybody gotten one of these rat cards from our ministry, Glad Tidings 3 a.m.? All right, so uh, certainly before you leave here this evening, make sure that you get a rat card. Now, this rat card, it just has information about the ministry and what we do. And also as well, it, actually, my show of hands, who here has been blessed? Who has been blessed by these series of meetings? Now, one of the things that we communicate to persons is that without the hearty financial support of the persons who are blessed, we literally could not do the work that we do. And so we have a number of, of different uh, mechanisms and means by which you can contribute. And so if you have been blessed, please consider becoming a financial contributor to Glad Tidings uh, 3 a.m. You know, because contrary to popular opinion, 
Uh, this would certainly be great, but you can't do the work of God without financial resources. And we do know that we live in the age of prosperity preaching, and there's a, a lot of persons uh, who do the work of God deceitfully, and they try to do it in order to extort and, and to aggrandize themselves. Uh, but there is also a reality that for the work of God to move forward properly, that there is financial means that are necessary in order to make that a reality. So we just wanted to uh, say that very quickly. All right, now is everybody ready for our quiz? All right, now question number one, question number one. It says, what is the greatest educational agency in the world? What is the greatest educational agency in the world? What is the greatest educational agency in the world? Everybody got that? All right, question number two. It says, who is the house band of the home? 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 Question number three. It says, what are the sterner virtues? 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 Question number four. What ancient high priest loved peace more than faithfulness? What ancient high priest loved peace more than faithfulness? What ancient high priest loved peace more than faithfulness? And question number five, it says, how important is family worship? How important is family worship? Again, how important is family worship? Everybody get that? Amen. All right, we're going to start back from the beginning. Question number one, it says, what is the greatest educational agency in the world? And what is the answer to that question? The home. Yes, as we read from Adventist Home, that God has decreed that the home be the greatest of all educational agencies. The greatest. Question number two. It says, who is the house band of the home? So who is responsible for keeping the home together? The husband. And again, we're told that the true definition of husband is house band. All right, question number three. What are the sterner virtues? What are the sterner virtues? Yes, courage, integrity, force, patience, diligence, practical usefulness. Yes. All right, question number four. What ancient high priest loved peace more than faithfulness? Eli, yes. Now, who were the sons of Eli? Yes, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, were Hophni and Phinehas devout men of God that helped to spread a knowledge of God and his righteousness to the ends of the earth? No, the Bible says that they were sons of Belial. They were sons of Satan. All right, question number five. It says, how important is family worship? How important is family worship? Worship. On a scale of 1 to 10, how important is family worship? It's probably a 20. It's probably a 20 out of 10. Family, family worship is vitally important. And if you are not, it, it, actually I should say this, if you're living in a home where there is not consistent family worship, that is a great cause for alarm. A great cause for for long. And, it, and if that is your situation, that is certainly something that you should diligently pray over. Diligently pray over. All right, now in light of that, I'm going to pause and have a word of prayer, and by God's grace, we will begin.
Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I come before you humbly praying that you would please forgive me of my sins, that you would cleanse me from my unrighteousness. I pray that you would please anoint me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that your Holy Spirit, dear Father, may tabernacle in this place, that we may truly get a proper sense of what you're seeking to communicate to us. I pray that you would please remove all distractions. I pray, dear Father, that you would please be with our online audience, that you would please be with their hearts and their minds. I pray that you would be even with our young ones that are here, that you would give them comprehension and understanding that they may know that God even has a word for them at this stage of their life. And I pray that you would keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And again, just a quick little advertisement. If you have a cell phone, please either turn it off or put it on silent. As we have mentioned at this point at nauseum, we do not want to be communicating anything uh, and especially having the Holy Spirit move amongst us and any distractions come about unnecessarily as a result of these mechanisms. Now, in light of that, let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're going to start tonight in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9. Let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 9. Let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 36. And when you haven't, you can say amen. All right, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. Notice what the Bible says. It says, but when he saw the multitudes. Now, when this says he, who is this referring to? This is referring to Christ. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with indignation upon them. It says that he was moved with compassion. One of the greatest things that we need if we are really going to minister to souls is compassion. This is one of the greatest virtues that we can have as Christians. It says, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no what? And unfortunately, the great mass of Christianity today is unfortunately as sheep not having a shepherd. And as a result of that, there is no proper guidance amongst us. It says, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, notice, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are, are few. It says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his what? Into his harvest. So there is a vast multiplicity of souls that need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but what is the great dilemma as it pertains to the gospel commission? According to what we just read in uh, Matthew 9 and verse 38. There are too few laborers. Now, in light of that, notice what the prophet says. Now, does everybody see this? Now, this is a symbol of a globe, which is a representation of this planet. And this is a clock here. Now, what, um, what particular time is this clock about to strike? It's about to strike 12 midnight. And before this, series is, uh, before this series is over, we're going to get into detail as to what that midnight is. But this is a symbol of the fact that this planet is about to reach its midnight. Now, in light of that, do you think that that is a good thing or a bad thing? It's a very bad thing in the sense that the evil that is going to be uh, produced upon this planet is going to be terrible. It's a good thing in the sense that it's an indication that Jesus is about to come back. Notice. Notice this. This is a very powerful statement from a devotional book called To Be Like Jesus. It says, look into our what? Into our churches. It says, there are only a few real workers in them. I'll read that again. Look into our churches. There are only a few real workers. So there's a difference between being a worker and a real worker. 
It says the majority are irresponsible men and women. And this is from the top down, from the conference level, even to the lay person. This says they feel no burden for souls. You know, the, the, the great burden on a lot of uh, church leaders' heart is how much, how much tithe are we generating? What is our profit margin? It says they never lift when they work, when the work goes hard. These are the ones who have but one talent, notice, and hide that one in a napkin and bury it in the world. That is, they use all the influence they have in their temporal matters. So what the prophet is saying is that these persons are not necessarily irreligious. They're not whoremongers. They're not going to the club. They're not doing anything crazy. They just don't really love Jesus. And it's manifested in the fact that their affections are on the things of this earth. It says, in seeking the things of this life, they lose the future eternal life, the far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What can be said and done to arouse this class of church members to feel their accountability to man? To God. To God. You see, brothers and sisters, we really have to ask ourselves the question, do we fall into this category? And God is not doing this as a means of condemnation, but we really have to ask ourselves, are we real workers for the kingdom of heaven? This is the great one of the great questions that we must ask ourselves personally. It says, must the mass of professed Christian commandment keepers Hear the fearful fearful words, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of, of teeth. Now notice, now we've been going over this every night. Again, this is a symbol of the children of Israel and that mass exodus from the Medo-Persian realm. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, and let's notice what the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's notice what the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse number 10. It says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. And again, what is that word? What does that word in samples mean? Examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he do what? Fall. There had no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to, that ye may be able to bear it. So again, what group of people was the Apostle Paul referring to? Yes, the children of Israel. So again, this experience of the ancient Hebrews leaving this Medo-Persian realm, do you think that this has any significance to us living in this day and age of the world. Yes, it does. Again, notice. It says, Many are casting contempt upon the Old Testament scriptures, but these are not to lose their sacredness. Throughout all time, they are not to be dropped out of our instruction. Paul writes concerning the experiences of the people of God in ancient times. It says, the prophets spoke less for their own time than for the ages which have followed and for our own and for our own day. All right, now, does everybody see this? Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? Let's turn our Bible to the book of Romans. We're in uh, Corinthians. That is the book right before it. Let's turn our Bible to the book of Romans chapter 12. Let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse number 1. It 
Romans chapter 12, we're going to start in verse number 1. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living what? Sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your unreasonable service. It's reasonable. God is saying that it is the only reasonable thing for you to do to serve me. It says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of who? And the perfect will of God. This is a symbol of the fact that our minds need to be renewed. Now, what, now who helps us uh, to renew our minds? Yes, the Holy Spirit. Now, notice this. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of E.A. Sutherland. One of the, again, one of the greatest educational minds God ever gave to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Notice. This is in a book that he wrote called Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns. This says, education pure and simple in breath of its meaning is character what? Is character development. Character development. So education means the development of our character. Does that make sense? Now again, this is a question. What did we go over on uh, uh, Sunday night's message? What did we talk about on Sunday night's message? Yes, we talked about the family. We talked about the home. And we found out that the neglect of proper home instruction was one of the greatest things that led to the captivity of ancient Israel. Now, again, one of the great mechanisms that Satan used in order to get the children of Israel to be led into captivity was this subject of education. It was the subject of education. And again, education just means what? It means character development. So anything that influences our character is a means of education. Now, what are some of the things that help to influence our character in today's society? I'll say it again. Our surroundings. Now, what are some of the things that uh, surround us on a daily basis? Television. Do you think that television helps to affect our character? Yes. I was literally just looking at a newscast. Has anybody ever heard of something called true crime? True crime is a, is a, um, is a program that talks about murder cases and things like that. And there was a young woman that was so addicted to watching true crime that she was directly influenced to kill her, to kill her, boy, her boyfriend. And she was merely acting out the things that she saw on true crime. Now, in light of that, do you think that that helped to develop her character? Yes, it did. Now, what are some of the other things that helped to influence our character? Okay, the Word of God, yes. What else? Yes, the school system. Do you think that the school system helps to influence our character? Yes. Do you think that our associations help to influence our character? Yes. Yes, even the food that we eat. All right, now what we're going to do, we're going to go through some of the experiences of the educational agencies that were raised up to help educate the ancient Hebrews. Notice, now when we see this picture here, is there anything that comes to our imagination? Yes, this is actually an artist's rendition of the prophet Elisha. Now, was Elisha a man of God? Yes, yes he was. Notice this. This says, wherever in Israel God's plan of education was carried into effect, its results testified of its author. Now, who was the author? It was God. It says, but in very many households, the training appointed by heaven and the characters thus developed were alike what? Rare. Now, were, were there a lot of Moseses in ancient Israel? Were there a lot of Joshua's? Were there a lot of Caleb's? No. It says, God's plan was but partially and imperfectly fulfilled. 
by unbelief, notice, by unbelief and by disregard of the Lord's directions, the Israelites surrounded themselves with temptations that few had power to resist. Now, let's put this into modern day terms. What are some of the worldly temptations that surround us in this modern age? Social media. Is undue exposure to social media very detrimental to our character development? What about riding down the street and seeing a bunch of half-naked women on the billboard? Do you think that that will neg- negatively affect the character of righteous men? And even women, especially in this day and age. Y- yes, it will. And so this is why we have to be so vigilant with the things that surround us. I wonder why God told us as Seventh-day Adventists that we were to move out of the city and into the country. All right, this says, through unfaithfulness in the home and idolatrous influences without, many of the Hebrew youth received an education differing widely from that which, for which God had planned for them. They learned the ways of the what? Of the heathen. So it was directly as a result of unfaithfulness in the home that so many of the Hebrews fell into apostasy. Now, how do you think God was able to counteract the apostasy that was taking place in the home? Notice, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. Yes, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's notice what the Bible says. We're talking about education, which is merely character development. 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to start in verse number 1. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto who? Elisha, behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down the what? They cut down the wood, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was what? For it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and it cast and cast it in thither, and the iron did what? Now, is it a natural thing for iron to swim in water? No, it is not. So in other words, Elisha, by the ministration of the Holy Spirit, performed a miracle. Yes. It says, therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and he and he took it. You see, this is a symbol of a concept called the school of the prophets. Now, has anybody ever heard of the schools of the prophets? Yes, notice. This says to meet this growing evil again. This is from the book Education. This says to meet this growing evil, God provided other agencies to aid parents in the work of education. This says uh, from the earliest times, prophets had been recognized as teachers divinely appointed. In the highest sense, the prophet was one who spoke by direct inspiration communicating to the people the messages he had received from God. But the name was given also to those who, though not so directly inspired, were divinely called to instruct the people in the works and the, ra- and the ways of God. So in modern terms, a secondary prophet would be someone who would be like a pastor or an evangelist. Does that make sense? It says, For the training of such a class of teachers, Samuel, my forefather, By the Lord's direction, established the schools of the what? He established the schools of the prophets. So why was the only reason the school of the prophets was necessary? Yes. So as a result of the idolatrous influences in the home and without, 
in order to help aid parents, the schools of the prophets were established. And again, this idea of sending off our children to school is a new phenomenon. Every ancient civilization practiced homeschooling. All right, again, this is a uh, picture of a gentleman by the name of A.T. Jones, one of the greatest intellects that God gave to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Notice, this says we find then that the teaching in the schools of the prophets embraced at least the following studies. Notice, wisdom. Do you know, many times we, we don't actually understand that wisdom needs to be studied. It says wisdom, knowledge, science, manual labor, music, poetry, temperance, morals, law, history, reading, writing, and what? And numbers. But the one greatest thing overall, in all and through all, in the Lord's schools, was the pervading presence of the divine teacher, the what? The Holy Spirit. So the greatest thing a school can ever do in the instruction of young people is to teach them how to have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go to Harvard, are you going to be taught how to have the Holy Spirit? If you go to a regular secular university, are, are you going to be taught how to have the Holy Spirit? Now, this is not to leave the impression, as it were, that there is anything necessarily wrong with secondary education on the university level. But, you know, the great reformer Martin Luther said, that the schools would become the great gates of hell if the Bible was not diligently uh, put as the foundation of the education. All right, this says, The experiences of Israel were recorded for our instruction. With us, as with Israel of old, success in education depends on fidelity in carrying out the Creator's what? The Creator's plan. This says adherence to the principles of God's word will bring as great blessings to us as it would have brought to the, to, to the Hebrew people. All right. Again, we're studying education and its influence and how this directly led to the captivity of ancient Israel. Now, when you see this picture, what do you think of? This is an artist's rendition of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew 27. Let's turn to Matthew 27. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew 27. Now don't get me wrong, the experience of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, this happened after the Babylonian captivity, many hundreds of years after the Babylonian captivity, but the question has to be asked, what in the world does education have to do with Jesus being arraigned before Pontius Pilate? I wonder if false education led to Jesus being arraigned before Pontius Pilate. All right, Matthew 27, starting in verse 11. The Bible says, And Jesus stood before the, governor, uh, before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered many things. I wonder if there's a lesson in that. It says, Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witnessed against thee? He answered him to never a word, insomuch that the, that the governor marveled what? As a result of the patience and forbearance that Jesus was manifesting, the Bible just doesn't say that he, that he uh, wondered at him, but it says that he marveled greatly. Marveled greatly. Verse 15, it says, Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Now was Barabbas a man of God? Was he a bastion of righteousness? No, he was, he was, he was a servant of Satan. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto what? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called what? Christ. 
for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, Notice, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But do you think that Pilate listened to the counsel of his wife? No, he didn't, like a fool. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Jesus. They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Now, did, did they respond by saying, Release him? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. I wonder how the favored people of God got so much to the place that they were actually calling for the crucifixion of God in the flesh. What type of deception must they have been brought under that instead of calling for him to continue his ministry and all of these things, even though we know that Jesus came to die, but why were the ancient Hebrews calling for the destruction of their Savior? Is that a good question? That's a very good question. Notice. Now, does anybody know who this man was? This is a gentleman by the name of F.C. Gilbert. This man was a Jewish convert to Seventh-day Adventism who wrote in the 20th century. Notice. Now, this was a very powerful article that he wrote in Ministry Magazine. Notice in what year? 1933. Was that a long time ago? Yes, it was. So he's about to tell us why the ancient Hebrews rejected Jesus. Notice. The question heading this article is an oft-repeated one. It seems difficult for many to understand how or why the Jewish... Uh, the Jewish nation rejected Jesus as the Savior and Messiah when the Old Testament scriptures were so filled with prediction type and prophecy regarding his advent to the world. Notice, it seems well nigh in inexplicable for some to harmonize the rejection of Jesus by the Pharisees while they were recognized as the leaders who sat in Moses' seat. Notice, because of the bitter experience through which the seed of Abraham passed in the captivity of Babylon for 70 years, after their deliverance from Babylon, exile, uh, the leaders determined never again to reject the counsel of God's word. Now, was that a good thing? Yes, but notice, the influential men of Israel feared the serious consequences which might overtake them if they were again led away from the true God. And so he uh, goes on to quote from Ezra. Notice, this says, um, After Alexander the Great worshipped in the temple at Jerusalem, following his reception by uh, Jadua, the high priest, a spirit of friendliness developed between the Greeks and the Jews. Alexander's generals, generals found it difficult to understand why their chief should embrace the high priest when they met on Mount Scopus, instead of putting him to death. Alexander told his officials, notice, that what occurred that day was shown him in a vision. I wonder who gave Alexander the Great that vision. Do you know, it's, a, it's so amazing that the historian Josephus says that when Alexander the Great came to Jerusalem, that the rabbis actually showed Alexander the Great in Daniel chapter 8, how the Bible prophesied that he would overtake the Medo-Persian Empire. This says, um, shown him in a, uh, in a vision uh, when he was in uh, Macedonia, and he wanted the privilege of entering the temple and worshiping the god of Jadua. Greece, notice, assured the Jews that they desired to be their true friends and benefactors. They were desirous of learning more of the god of the Hebrews. Notice, an arrangement was entered into that allowed a large number of rabbis from Jerusalem to go to where? Now, were they teaching the principles of righteousness in Alexandria? 
Has anybody ever heard of the library at Alexandria? Anybody ever heard of this? Now, this is just some historical context for those of us who are not aware of this reality. This is so vitally important. You see, Alexandria at this time was located in Egypt. And Greece had become the world empire at that time, and they had overtaken that region in Alexandria. And as a result of that, much of the pagan philosophy that was predominant in the world found its concentration in Alexandria. Now, in light of that, do you think that it was a good thing that these rabbis were going to go down to Alexandria to learn pagan philosophy? What do you think was naturally going to happen when the holy seed started mixing with the unholy seed? Apostasy. Notice. This says, an arrangement was entered into, and it says, and translate the writings of the Jewish scriptures into the Greek language. Greek scholarship and learning was seeking every possible avenue of information to enhance the value of its own culture and refinement. Many of the, el of the elders of Israel feared the results of such a course. The sages remembered the sorrows of their ancestors who came in contact with the heathen manners and customs. They counseled the younger men against such a procedure. These, in turn, argued that it would be an advantage notice for strong, thoughtful, vigorous young men to enter the schools of Greece. So they thought it would be a good idea for the ancient Hebrews to go down to Harvard and Yale, to go to Oxford and Cambridge, and they believed that as a result of this, that this would enhance the learning of the young men of Israel. Now, we're not even going to finish reading this entire article, but do you think that this enhanced the knowledge of those Jewish young men? No, it didn't. You see, F.C. Gilbert goes on to talk about that the great reason why the Jewish nation rejected and killed Jesus was because of false education. You see, as a result of them infusing themselves with this Grecian philosophy, this is why they thought that when the Messiah would come, that he would be a conquering king. Because that comes directly from Greek mythology. And as a result of that, this is why this, uh, the, uh, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. This is why they didn't believe in angels, because that came from Greek philosophy. Now, in light of that, if we ourselves, even as Seventh-day Adventists, are subsisting upon Greek philosophy, what do you think is going to happen to us? The same thing. Now, do you think that we are currently feasting on Greek philosophy? Yes, we are. It is in all of our schools, and it's also in, all, in almost all of our churches. Notice. Skip has this. Notice, after the return from Babylon, much attention was given to religious instruction. This is taken from Desire of Ages. All over the country, synagogues were erected where the law was expounded by the priests and scribes. And schools were established which, together with the arts and sciences, professed to teach the principles of righteousness. But these agencies became what? Corrupted. It says at the bottom, they trusted to the sacrifices and ordinances themselves instead of resting upon him to whom they what? To whom they pointed. So as a result of them fusing themselves with all of this Grecian philosophy, they literally got to the point where they thought that sacrificing animals was going to give them salvation. This says Satan told them that... that in order to maintain their authority, they must put Jesus to death. This is talking about the Sanhedrin. Notice. This counsel they rejected. They followed. So who was counseling the Sanhedrin in order to kill Jesus? When, th when those Sanhedrin officials were meeting, Satan was literally in their midst. Literally. With the exception of a few who dared not speak their minds, the Sanhedrin received the words of Caiaphas as the words of God. In rejecting the proof of the divinity of Jesus, these priests and rulers had locked themselves in impenetrable what? Impenetrable. 
They had come wholly under the sway of Satan to be hurried by him over the brink of eternal ruin. Notice, yet such was their deception that they were well pleased with themselves. Now notice this last statement. They regarded themselves as what? As patriots. Lord have mercy. And it's this same misguided patriotism that is eventually going to be used to enact a national Sunday law. They regarded themselves as patriots who were seeking the nation's salvation. Lord have mercy. All right, again, th when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? This is a symbol of education as we seek to bring this message to a close. Now, does everybody see how this influence of education helped to lead to the captivity of the ancient Hebrews? Is this clear? All right. Again, what is this here? What is this a picture of? Yes, this is just a symbol of a home in the country. Yes. Now, do you think that this type of environment is very helpful for our children? Yes, it is. It is in the home that the education of the child is to what? And again, what does that word education mean? Yes, character development. Here is his first school. Here with his parents as instructors, he is to learn the lessons that are to guide him throughout life. Lessons of respect, obedience, reverence, and self-control. How important then is the school in the what? The school in the home. The school in the home. Now, this is a symbol of something called anatomy and physiology. Now, do you think that having a knowledge of anatomy and physiology is greatly important for our education? Both old and young. Yes. Again, from the spirit of prophecy. Now, who here by show of hands has heard of a book called Child Guidance? Now, who here has actually read and studied the book Child Guidance? Even fewer hands. Brothers and sisters, especially those of us that have uh, small children and even teenagers that are living in the home, these are vo volumes that we desperately need to go through. Again, this two weeks is a, is a series of revival and reformation. And again, what would be the point of us having these two weeks if we don't diligently seek to implement the principles that God has given to us? It says children should be early taught in simple, easy lessons, the rudiments of uh, physiology and hygiene. The work should be begun by mother in the home and should be faithfully carried forward in the school. As the pupils advance in years, instruction in this line should be continued until they are qualified to care for the house they live in. Now, when this says care for the house they live in, does anybody know what that is referring to? Yes, that's actually talking about the body. It's talking about the body. It says they should understand the importance of guarding against disease by preserving the vigor of every organ and should also be taught how to deal with common diseases and accidents. All right. Everybody see this. Now, this is a bottle of poison. Now, what type of poison is this? This is the poison of gossip. Now, do you think that gossip is unfortunately helping to educate a great majority of us, even as Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists? Notice what the prophet says. Many who listen to the preaching of the word of God make it the subject of criticism at home. I wonder if Satan even tries to tempt us to even criticize these messages when we ourselves go home. This says they sit in judgment on the sermon as they would on the words of a lecturer or political speaker. The message that should be regarded as the word of the Lord to them is dwelt upon with trifling or sarcastic comment. The minister's character, motives, and actions and the conduct of fellow members of the church are freely discussed. Severe judgment is pronounced gossip or slander repeated, and this in the hearing of the unconverted. Often these things are spoken by parents in the hearing of their own children. Lord have mercy. 
Thus are destroyed respect for God's messengers and reverence for their message. And many are taught to regard lightly God's word itself. Thus, in the homes of professed Christians, many youth are educated to be what? So it's not necessarily the atheism that they hear when they go to public school. It's the gossip of us as parents. And then we have the audacity to come to church and act like we're faithful Christians. This says they wonder that it is so difficult to reach them with moral and religious influences they do not see that their own example has hardened the hearts of their children. Is this serious? Brothers and sisters, if we have been guilty of any of this, we need to get down on our knees and ask God for deep repentance. It says the good seed finds no place to take root and Satan catches it away. All right, does everybody see this? This is a symbol of a school, but in light of this dear woman right here, what type of school do you think this is? This is a Catholic school. Now, do you think that we should be sending our children to Catholic schools? Now, according to Bible prophecy, the Catholic Church is the Antichrist, Antichrist system of Bible prophecy. Now, in light of that, how can any professed Protestant, yea, Seventh-day Adventist, send their children to be educated by the Antichrist? Notice, now does anybody know who this man was? It's a gentleman by the name of Charles Chiniqui. This man is an ex-Canadian uh, French Catholic of the, uh, uh, of the uh, 19th century. Now notice what this man said in a very powerful book that he wrote called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. He converted to the faith of the Word of God. Notice. We read in the history of paganism that parents were often in those dark ages slaying their children upon the altars of their gods to appease the wrath or to obtain their favors. But we now see a stranger thing. Notice, it is that of Christian parents forcing their children into the temples and to the very feet of the idols of Rome under the fallacious notion of having them educated. The Protestant who drags his children to the feet of the priests of Rome is either a disguised infidel or a hypocrite. It is simply ridiculous for us, for such a man, to speak of his religious convictions or beg respect for them. His very humble position at the feet of a Jesuit or nun Begging respect for his faith is a sure testimony that he has none to lose. Brothers and sisters, we may not be necessarily sending our children to Catholic schools, but are our children receiving Catholic education? Brothers and sisters, I am telling you, if, I ha if, I ha if my wife and I had children growing up as at in their adolescence and teenage years, I would not dare send them to public schools or what is commonly called education. I wouldn't dare do it. All right, everybody see this? Yes, this is a symbol of the mind or the heart. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John as we bring this to a close. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So in light of what we just read in verse 3, what is the purpose of having the breath of life? To know God. If we are not bending our energies to know God, we are literally wasting the breath of life that God has given to us. Notice. This is taken from mind, character, and personality. Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of what? We need to understand the true science of education. 
Now, that word education, again, what does that mean? That means character development. So this says we need to understand the principles that pertain to character development. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of what? In the kingdom of God. Now, whose agency do we need in order to properly develop our characters to be just like Jesus? We need the Holy Spirit. We need his presence vitally in our life. Now, how do we obtain the Holy Spirit? We need to ask. Now, how do we ask? It is, just, is it just casual asking of the Holy Spirit? So we need to plead for the Holy Spirit in... We need to plead for the Holy Spirit in prayer by studying the Word of God diligently. Again, in light of the character that we have to develop in this day and age of the world, can we just have a casual prayer life? Again, in light of the time of trouble such as never was that is soon to come upon us, can we be content with merely having a 10-minute prayer life? Is merely reading a, a devotional book in the morning going to properly equip us spiritually in light of what is coming? Brothers and sisters, I don't say this as a means of antagonism, but if we believe that, we are deceiving ourselves very heavily. And again, this is not just for us as adults. Those of us who are younger children, whether we are, you know, five, six, uh, teenagers, whatever the age may be, we ourselves have to have our own personal experience. Because are, are our children going to make it to heaven off of our faith? No, they are not. Especially when they come to that proper age of reasoning, they have to make their own decisions. And we have to ensure that we are diligently doing everything we possibly can to ensure that they are put in the best position to make a decision for Christ. And again, the, the appeal is just very simple. By show of hands, who here wants to say that I want my education and my character development to be patterned after the ways of heaven. Just by show of hands, wherever you are. Amen. And in light of that, let us kneel and have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the principles of character development. We're thankful for the influence of true education, but we are also keenly aware, as we have been made aware this evening, of the influence of false education. Just as an the ancient Hebrews were led to do very abominable things as a result of these nefarious influences, that, Father, I pray sincerely that you would help us to realize and be aware of the influences that surround us. I pray that we will be intentional with the things that we give our attention to, that we have to be very careful of watching, seeing, hearing that which will suggest an impure thought. And that is not just sexual impurity, that's any impurity. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to watch unto prayer. And especially for those of us who are parents that have uh, children who are in their adolescence or teenage years, the Lord, I pray that we will really seek you diligently so that we may understand how the education of our children is supposed to be structured. Many children would have been saved eternally if they were just raised properly. And so I just pray, Holy Father, that you would please keep us to this end and be with us as a church family in general as we are praying for revival and reformation. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would help us to confess whatever things that need to be done, anything that needs to be put away, dear Lord, so that your Holy Spirit may fall upon us afresh. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in light of that, is if there is anyone who has a testimony as to how they were blessed, uh, how this message affected them personally, you can take this time just to testify as to how the Lord spoke to you personally, as to how the Lord spoke to you personally, especially in this realm of education, especially in this realm of education. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Amen. 
Yeah, there's a very powerful statement in uh, the Spirit of Prophecy. It says that uh, practice often repeated grows into confirmed habit and becomes character. So that is very true. What we practice on a day-by-day basis, this will determine the type of person that we will become. You say something? Why is it so hard to access? That is a very good question. Um, you know, maybe possibly even later we can set up some type of Q&A, maybe on Sabbath or something. But um, the reason why true education is so hard to access and real Christian education, because some people, um, and this is no you know, fault of their own, but a lot of times it's communicated that Christian education is merely receiving the world's education. You just pray before class. And many people think that that's Christian education merely because you're praying before class. But that's not what makes Christian education Christian education. Now, part of the reason why it's so, access, uh, so hard to access proper Christian education is because, especially in the realm of us as Seventh-day Adventists, we have so let down our guard that all of these false influences have corrupted what God originally gave to us. And so whether you talk about on the academic level, like for instance, God wanted it that there would be a school connected with every church so that when people would convert to Seventh-day Adventism, the parents would always have a school to send their children to. But unfortunately, there are many church schools that are closing down as a result of a variety of different reasons. Also on the collegiate level, um, I went to one of our schools to study theology. And uh, this was a little over 10 years ago, and the type of things that are being taught on the collegiate level in our schools, you can get a bachelor's degree in seven-day Adventist education, master's, even PhD, and never hear about the investigative judgment, where the spirit of prophecy is openly bashed as literal heresy, to the point where all of the foundational truths that God has given to us are almost wholly rejected. I mean, most of our, uh, of our professors, uh, most of them got their PhDs at, at, at either secular universities or they got them at Sunday institutions. And so as a result of that, how in the world can you get your PhD from an apostate institution and then come down to a Seventh-day Adventist school and teach the young people the three angels' messages? Literally, and so we've gotten to the point where credentials and calling, you know, the person doctor and all of these things is, is the thing that we consider to be the most important. And, and, and sadly, as a result of that, this is why Christian education is so hard to access. It's even to the point, Desire of Ages, it talks about that, that God intentionally ensured that John the Baptist and Jesus did not go to the rabbinical schools of their time. We're told that the rabbinical uh, schools of that time would have wholly unfitted John the Baptist for the work that God gave to him. Now, mind you, <laughs> we're in a worse position than those schools of the rabbis. So as a result of that, I, if, if, a, if a person lit, felt truly called to the gospel ministry, I would not encourage that young man to go to the rabbinical schools of this day and age, where the Seventh-day Adventists and certainly otherwise. And so, you know, just to simply answer the question, we have permitted, and I say permitted because the Bible says that the gates of hell would not prevail. So, God, so Satan can't do anything to God's people that we do not permit him to do. So we have permitted Satan to plant his banner amongst us, unfortunately. Is there anybody else? Is there anyone else? And uh, just very quickly, just closing, I know that the time is a little past, but um, I'm very thankful for the blessings of, of uh, these principles of true education. Because again, you know, going to public school and even going to, you know, Christian school and even Sony Adventist schooling, really understanding what God's ideal uh, is for us, especially as young people, in understanding the principles of righteousness. You know, we're even told that science and, and chemistry and physics and all of these things were to be taught from the Bible. And I, and I truly wish that that's how physics and all of those things were taught, because if they were taught from a biblical standpoint, I would have had far more interest in them. And so we have to really teach our children that, that God is the God of biology, that God is the God of chemistry. He's the God of all these things. And so we're merely just discovering the beautiful things that he has created. 
Uh, but in line with that, let us have a small word of prayer again. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for these principles. I pray to the Lord that you would help us and give us the wisdom that we need as to how to uh, navigate all of this. Some of us are in um, trying predicaments, but I just pray that you would give us the wisdom that we need in order to make right decisions. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Without him.